for the microphone to introduce the floor. Yes, we're plugged in, I think. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you've already had the chance to walk around a little bit at the fair. Uh, for those who were here yesterday evening, you've noticed that we had quite a sensational evening. And um, let me first introduce briefly myself. My name is Nanne Decking. I'm the chairman of TEFAF, living here in New York for a long time. but. Needless to say, I'm Dutch, because you could pick that up after my second word. Um, I'm here with uh, a very esteemed person from the museum world uh, who you came to see and came to listen to. Um, 
but he's being interviewed before I mention him by Tom, by Tom Marx. And Howard, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Um, you all know Howard uh, when you're a New Yorker from his involvement in the Dia Art Foundation. He left a real mark on our city, and so did the Dia Art Foundation. Um, now, of course, at LACMA, we're fortunate enough to have, as you have seen, hopefully, and otherwise you have to go right after this talk, this interview, a, a wonderful collection of, uh, of, of, of works from the LACMA done with one of the oldest techniques in the photography world with the camera obscura. Uh, it's quite a, quite a sensation. Yeah. So without further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you, Nana. Uh, Michael, uh, great to see you here in New York. Um, just uh, to give you a sense of what I, I think we should do in the next hour is obviously Vera Luther's wonderful uh, camera obscura works um, from paintings in the LACMA collection. There are a selection of them just down the hall. And if you haven't seen them, you, you must go and see them after this. But uh, it would be nice to talk, Michael, about that project, which I feel is quite a personal project uh, for you at LACMA, um, and then perhaps also use that to talk about what the plans are for LACMA, because in a sense, the project does relate to what's happening with, with the new building and, and the old buildings there. Um, so to kick off, uh, I mean, you've known Vera Luta since your time at DEER, at the DEER Art Foundation. Um, can you tell me what, what first drew you to, to her work? Um, well, thanks, Tom. It's nice to be here. And I should first note that we have a living artist and Vera Luter's here. So <laughs> we're happy to have her here. If, if you come back tomorrow, you know, if you come back tomorrow, she will be talking. It's rare to have the old master and the living artist in the same breath there. So <laughs> we have that. So, uh, yes, um, I've known Vera for years and years since. I was first introduced to her work by a collector in New York who had found her when she was doing some of her first works in her, can I say, squatter's apartment in New York City in the Midtown where she had, um, she made her transformation into this kind of work. Now, Vera can speak more specifically about this, but she was not trained in photography. You were working in ceramics uh, and, and came to the US, you had this apartment in Midtown, and at one point, and I'm gonna oversimplify, you decided to paint your window black or blacken the entire apartment, scratch a pinhole in it, I know that's an oversimplification, and made this miraculous image of Midtown Manhattan by putting photographic paper on the wall and letting the room itself be the camera. And I remember being told about this and seeing that first work, and it was like a miracle, the whole idea that the apartment was a camera and capturing and ringing the city through this tiny hole and onto this paper, upside down and backwards, of course, but you turn your images usually right side up. They're clearly backwards in that sense. Um, and then quite separately, um, Dia's curator, Lynn Cook, uh, had found your work, and I can't remember how, um, and we were at DIA and proposed to make an exhibition. And it was interesting because um, Lynn was interested in showing the work. Some of you may have seen, there was a very famous work of the Pepsi-Cola sign across the East River that I think was well, very well known in New York City. Um, and I was interested in your practice because we were just starting to think about the museum at DIA, Beacon, in Beacon, New York and I had found this old factory, um, and it was empty, you know, abandoned, and it had a feeling in it, but there was no way I took pictures of it and you couldn't quite capture it. And so we kind of collaborated in the sense that Lynn was creating a general, an exhibition of, your, of Vera's work generally, and I asked if she would make images inside the old factory before it was transformed into a museum. Some of you have seen those images. They're incredibly moving. I, I mean, one of my favorites is the clock has been stopped for a long time. Uh, there's ones with incredible depth and perspective. And so, long story short to this, We'd always said maybe we would work on another project, and we were in the midst of thinking about our new building and tearing down some old buildings. And before we did that, um, I said to Vera, maybe it would be interesting to 
make images of a museum before it becomes nothing, as we made an image of a factory before it became a museum. And that connected with her interest in working inside the museum, which she had already done at the National Gallery. So it was a kind of kismet of a lot of things coming together um, and trying to get her out to the good weather in California. So, so Vera has been uh, taking part doing this residency uh, at LACMA for, well, for some time now. Uh, and, and can you just explain kind of what that residency consists of? Because it has quite a visible effect on, on the museum and its daily life, doesn't it? Yes, well, um, so we agreed on this not really knowing what was entailed. Luckily, a curator at LACMA, Jenny King, who's also here, was willing to work with me on this, and she's really done the lion's share of the work, but we began to understand what it meant to have Vera Luter working inside a museum. Um, and I won't say she's quite living there, but we did turn a gallery into a photo studio uh -huh. so she could make the work there. We built huge cameras that are the size of this stage area in wood, moved them around. Some were craned. So it's like a packing balconies. crate in the middle of the museum. Huge. And so people would see this, they would see the crane, and um, she also got permission. She has a, so you have these giant cameras that are giant, like container size. And then she has her equivalent of like an Instamatic, which is about this trunk size, and we made a deal where she could go, we're closed on Wednesdays, where she could start on Tuesday as the museum closed until the opening on Thursday morning, and some of the images in the exhibition here are these, um, you know, like point and shoot, only 48 hour exposures of the old master paintings that were made right in the galleries. So we'll, we'll get onto the old master paintings, um, but because some of the other works uh, it's true to say are, are things that are far longer exposures and, and some of those larger uh, pieces have taken five, six weeks and I understand one months. work is going to take six or seven months for the What's European the galleries. What's the longest exposure? Seven months. So this is like don't try this at home. <laughs> seven month exposures and um, you know it ranges from these few days or even hours in full daylight to seven months, and I, uh, some of the biggest pictures that are here are uh, 30 or 60 days. Now, in terms of, for you, it's quite a, I guess, quite a personal project because you've, you've known Vera for, for quite some time, but also what does that, that presence of these objects, these quite foreign pieces of equipment in the galleries mean for you in terms of what, of what you think about the role of the artist in a museum like LACMA? I mean, it's very visible in that sense. Um, well, I have always worked with artists. That's been my whole life. And I think that artists, uh, obviously, they bring light, light and life to our world. Um, museums sometimes seem to want to separate the objects from the artists. You know, better to work with dead artists, then you don't have to worry about them. And then you can just bring the objects and show them. But part of what I wanted to do in coming to LACMA, which is a museum of everything and of old art, was bring that spirit that Dia had where an where you would actually facilitate the artist and bring the artist inside to be involved not just in showing their work, but in almost shaping what the museum's program and image is. So the first thing I did is I, I hated the designs that a number of people had made for a new LACMA logo, and I called John Baldessari, and within a week he said, come down to the studio, I have an idea for you. Or Chris Burden's Urban Light, which completely changed the architecture, putting the art out front. So a lot of what I've wanted to do is, you know, in, in, if you go back 500 years or 600 years, artists were at the center of thinking. They were brought in to think about how buildings should be built, how things should be done generally in cities, and you know that from the Renaissance, from many other uh, times, and it seems like in our professionalization, and we, we wanted to sort of separate that a curator does this, an artist makes the work, and then you bring it into the box of the museum, which is to lose some of the essence of the creative thinking of artists. I mean, in ancient times, artists were part of the council of advisors, and so I've tried to create a loose council of advisors and artists, even if they're not officially on a board, they're always telling me what they think about the museum. Their eyes are showing me what the museum can be. 
Uh, and then in many cases, we've gotten them involved, uh, Franz Vest, uh, Jorge Pardo, uh, Barbara Kruger, in actually shaping physical parts of the museum. Well, I've always, I've always admired museums in which living artists are able to have works that comment on, on what is happening in terms of the historical moment. I mean, for me, one of the great uh, and the wittiest presentations is somewhere like the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam, where a Maurizio Catalan waxwork breaks through the floor in this one of the, the early 19th century Dutch galleries. I, I, I mean, that's something that we need to work with, right? In right, and, and Maurizio's the great uh, philosophical prankster, his gold toilet at the Guggenheim is fantastic. Um, but we've, the 90s when I was growing up in the museum world was a period of a lot of artists and critique. And he, in a way, comes out of that conceptual critique, Maurizio. Um, but when I was going to art school, we were talking about, well, that era in, is in a way already over because you can make so much commentary about critiquing, of course these institutions have problems and issues and they have uh, problematic points of view on history and culture and co colonization and all these things. But in the end, we have to make a culture that's our responsibility to make something. So um, the commentary's kind of been there. I think the question is how do you actually engage the artists in the construction of the thing that moves forward in our set of values. You, you, you talk about moving forward and an artist helping you see the future of, of the institution. But in a sense, what Vera's photographs have done, at least the photographs of the buildings, which are, are, are slated for demolition, three of them, is think about partly about the past of the institution. Is, is that fair No, to they're say? about the future because they're about future memory. Okay. Right, for me. She might not say that, but. I sort of saw that her work engages and indulges memory. E even, I almost sometimes, maybe it's because I've seen too much of her work, I almost think like, are my memories in negative or are they in positive? And, and so I thought, well, before we're even tearing down the buildings, maybe we should be making these images of future memory because they will be gone and what is the image of memory in that sense? And I, the buildings at LACMA are much maligned by architecture critics. They're a mess. They're in every guidebook. It says they're a mess, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a few things about that is that doesn't mean there haven't been kids whose lives or people whose lives haven't been shaped by seeing art in those buildings. So as Peter Zumthor, the architect who's replacing them, said, you can love ugly things. You know, you can have a deep relationship to something that's meant something to your life. So one, never take for granted that there isn't a, a, a very positive relationship even to something that's potentially ugly. And then that the destruction will be psych psych psychologically difficult. And so even in that sense of psychology, what could celebrate or bridge or think about that? You know, the thought is only an artist. Only an artist could see the future or see that. So that was, it was really as much about thinking well, about can, what the future will hold after they're not there. I can see that, that the, the negative creates a thing where, where things that are solid become ghosted in a sense. And so in a sense, you feel like these are images in which you see the future of, of these buildings or the future way of remembering them. That's what you're saying. Plus, no one's ever been able to take a beautiful photograph of those buildings, but when you see, and we will reveal later, the images that she has taken of the so-called mess of architecture, it looks beautiful. So all of a sudden, that future memory will be something beautiful. And uh, that was mostly my sort of hope to have that dialogue. Vera was also interested in being inside the museum, inside gallery spaces. This is what she had done at the National Gallery. And so that inside, outside has been part of the project, f making images of the galleries. I sort of imagined the great 19th century, you know, paintings of art museums and galleries and what would be so the salon equivalent. pictures the salon, and, yeah. And, yeah so what would be the equivalent of that now of the Piranesi or whatever those images would be for Vera to make an image inside the galleries which she was already interested in doing because is that right the 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 very long exposure image of course will catch somehow the traces of the visitors and the movement through the gallery well, so interestingly, you don't ever see people because people move. They're not there long enough. But we, yeah, well, it's hard to hold still for a few months. Um, well, but. you think about the, you know, people who are photographed by, by the Victorian photographers. You did have to hold still for about two minutes. Yes, you did. But there's that interesting aspect to the, the people being absent. 
Uh, and there's an eerie abstraction about all her work because it doesn't include those kinds of images that we're so used to seeing in photography because photography now is sort of the moment. And so whether it's a blurred image or a person or motion or all of those things that we associate with that, um, these don't have that. They're hardly photographs. They're really just images closer maybe to painting uh, than to photography. Well, you, since you mentioned painting, and, and since the uh, photographs that are exhibited here are of old master paintings in the collection, let's talk about, about those a little, because I think that's a really interesting moment uh, for her career too. We were talking just before about how these are the first two-dimensional images uh, or, or objects, surfaces that uh, Vera Luta has photographed. W were you very surprised when you saw the results of these images? Um, it's, so we were also doing three-dimensional images and architecture and other things, and her obsession with this idea of like the copy stand and bringing these pictures, I frankly wasn't sure I understood at first what she had in mind, and she described, of course, how she could enlarge or reduce. Um, and if you see in some of the images, you'll see black specks, like a splat of paint or something which is actually the glare of light off the varnish. So the, the spotlight goes onto the varnish. It has, and it's like what you would keep out of a good photograph of an old master that you were gonna sell at, you know, Tefaf. You would wanna make sure there's no light um, reflection. And so she's allowed that, for example, to be part of the image. And it's eerie, especially on the one with the ghostly rabbit and then this like splot of black and dots and then you see little dots in it like mm -hmm. like Vermeer's paintings right because the idea that he painted through a pinhole so I, I, well, I wonder as well if it's if it's a type of I mean if it's the lead white paint I was just saying that some of the berries look like a kind of bush of or, or a bunch of, of little eyes that are, that have made their way into the canvas I mean they are transformative things they totally changed how you would think about the original yeah. painting. Yeah, so when I, I guess I haven't been so focused on the two-dimensional quality because there are all these other qualities of light. And of course, there's space. When you frame down into a painting, you have space. There's a space across the water. So they're two, sort of two-dimensional. They're not really in the sense that these are all figurative images. Now, she will work on some abstractions, and then we'll have to reconsider all those thoughts. But um, yeah, the little circles of light, the little circles that show up. Uh, one of our curator, Patrice Marindel, who probably will say this tomorrow, he, he immediately he saw the Lucretia image, which is, of course, a martyrdom. And, and he said it, it has become an ascension because of the change in light and even the reversal, which changes the directionality of the composition. Uh, and similarly, in the market picture, uh, the abundance of the, uh, of the uh, fowl and, and uh, meat and everything, and you have this dark black swan-like shape that is ominous and the exact opposite of the meaning of the picture. So yes, they are really transformed. On the other hand, the still life has an equality where you're not sure it's negative. So it, and, the, and even, in the, even in the seascape, the Dutch seascape, it's not clear it's negative because it's a storm and you don't know that for sure. Still transformative. I mean, there is something about a, a, a solid object painted in a still life that's seen in negative Obviously, the shadows become the moments of, of levity rather than the moments of, of heaviness. Yeah. So it seems somehow to float. Yeah, shadows become objects. Sometimes objects become shadows. Uh, a figure that is uh, more prominent can become a ghost. And uh, yeah, it, 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 they are something completely different. And, and that was the fun of it. When uh, this came up, I, we were asked, well, the TAFAF was going to feature a museum each year. And uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Green, my cousin, actually, whose wife is here, uh, he said, well, how would LACMA be interested in being one of those museums? And you could bring your old master paintings to promote something or a show you were doing at LACMA. And then I thought, why would we bring our old master paintings to New York? There are quite a few here and quite a few on view, but this was a part of the early conversations with Vera, and it seemed, oh, that would be fantastic because she would bring our old master painters through the eyes of an artist and completely transformed into the present. So that's what's been wonderful to see. Well, on, on that note, 
what can these paintings, uh, sorry, these photographs tell us, if anything, about, about what is the role of the old masters rather than the, the contemporary versions of them in, in the LACMA collection? Well, we like to think that a lot of what we try to do at LACMA is to make old art cool, right? To really, there's I've a, seen your Snapchat account. There's a little, uh, there's a, been a little lull in the, that's always changing. Audiences are always looking at over different times of, of life and epochs at different things. And there seems to be a, a, you know, a movement towards the present and towards art of the present, which is good because actually in the time those paintings were painted, especially the Dutch uh, landscapes, people were obsessed with the art of the present. That was the art of the present. So there's nothing wrong with that uh, obsession, but it, it, what I know, being friends with a lot of artists, is that the people who love to come to LACMA and go to the old master galleries most are artists. And you have artists like Jeff Koons, who every time he sells one of his sculptures, he takes that money and he goes and buys 19th century painting or earlier, so that you know that the artists are deeply interested in their dialogue with the past, and maybe because the markets are constantly shifting and there's a social cachet to collecting contemporary art right now, which is fine, it's good, it's great, it supports artists, um, but I think the idea is to, is if you can see that those artists that are so highly sought after, like Vera, are actually looking at old master paintings, then it gives the galleries a new life for that next generation. And I mean, also in that, uh, that perspective, Vera's, Vera's images, where do you feel they fit into, there is another tradition of contemporary artists looking at old master pictures, making versions of, some of those things uh, are pastiche, some of those things, are reimaginations, some of them are uh, critiques. Where, where do they fit in, in in that tradition? Well, there are many traditions. I mean, art is a continuum. There's no, um, there are no breaks for me. I mean, I, I think that you could almost say that any good work of art is new. <laughs> you know, any good work of art is new because it's immediately present, it's changing your point of view. Um, I always am on the attack about the notion of the chronology of time that, as I love to quote uh, T.S. Eliot, about the idea that every new work of art changes the way we see the past. The past is always changing, right? Because if you, something is made that disrupts or recontextualizes or forces a new view, it forces you to reevaluate the past. So we cannot think of the past as fixed. We have to think of it as constantly being revalued. And I think that's why artists are both always poking around and, um, I mean, sometimes poking fun of Marcel Duchamp, but not. You could think of artists just absorbing, they're stealing, they're commenting on, but there really is this wonderful continuum. And I think one of the things that we want to do in our museum is break down the separations. It's like if you put something in a past in that sense, it's to put it over there. And I think if we can bring it closer here through many ways, including just close looking, learning more, artists, um, even the idea of a little bit, we have more contemporary and modern art up front in our museum. When you walk through the threshold, you're walking through a, a work made so recently. It's a gateway drug. Yeah, but you know, so somebody says, oh, that's backwards. I said, is it backwards? You know, last I checked, I woke up today, in today's time, <laughs> and it takes a lot of work to think to go and capture a context and make a context to see a work from the past. So I, I think maybe we should just sort of, we just need to re keep reoriented ourselves, and artists are fantastic at, at helping us to see the past differently. In terms of, of thinking about breaking borders down and breaking down, uh, some of the old taxonomies. I mean, that's something that I feel is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it is part of the project for what the new LACMA and the new look LACMA yeah. will be. So maybe it's a good moment for us to, to segue into talking about that. I mean, I wanted to start by talking a bit about the, the building itself and, and about Peter Zumter uh, and, and just kind of giving us your sense of, of what first drew you to him as, as an architect who would be right for building a museum building on that scale? 
Well, for anybody who doesn't know, just to half a step backwards, uh, LACMA has a number of built, built new buildings designed by Renzo Piano, new public space. It's doubled its size. But what remained uh, problematic were the buildings built in the 60s and the 80s that we're talking about Vera making some images of. Um, and they, because we're in Los Angeles, have serious seismic issues. And so we have hundreds of millions of dollars of liability problem to bring those buildings to code. Neither the county nor the board had the stomach to do that. Uh, and it was considered much more efficient and beneficial to build new, which is often true in Los Angeles just because of, and also the buildings had been beat up a lot. The original buildings hadn't kept their integrity. So then the question was, how do you do that? Um, we had plans from Renzo Piano to maybe continue the, uh, the street he had designed in the new he, buildings. He has built two buildings. He's built so two, that, uh, two gallery uh, buildings and a restaurant and plazas. And he's building a museum next door now, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Uh, Rem Coolhouse, the architect, had famously discussed just tearing it all down for a rectangle that was organized by chronology and space. Um, there was, we did study restoration of the old buildings, and then I wanted to throw in a wild card. And I had worked with Peter Zumtor here in New York at DIA. He had been pointed, uh, I was pointed to him through our curator, Lynn Cook, but through, most importantly, artist Walter De Maria, who had no other architect he was interested in working with when we were talking about a shed or a building for one of his sculptures. And I went to see his work, including his shed over the archeological ruins in Coeur, and his work, he was just beginning the museum in Cologne, which you haven't, see, if you haven't seen this museum, Columba Museum, which was built over the ruins of a church, included even another chapel inside that, and then it included a series of galleries for the Columba collection, which is across all time and space. Uh, and I'd never seen anyone who had so sensitively dealt with a problematic historical site, ruins, and we have the La Brea tar pits, so they're very close, they're very, very important. They're the most paleontol important paleontological find in the United States. They're doing climate research there, and they're very weirdly beautiful, or ugly, as you like. Uh, and I thought, well, you need an architect who has a sensitivity to sight. And the second reason was that a lot of the proposals that have been made were about rationality. So Renzo Piano is famous for his grids, and Rem Coolhouse had wanted time and space order. I was interested in the problematic of time, and if you will, even a point of view of the unconscious, like how does art speak across time and place? Mm -hmm. um, and he was the architect, he, he's the last architect, he draws by hand, uh, it's all so tactile, the materials, that I thought maybe he could achieve something about that. And it was a very contrarian choice because in LA, of course, everything is supposed to be disposable. And everything is on the grid as well. Everything's LA, on the so. grid. And so I said, well, but here we have these tar pits that are like this weird darkness of psychology. Prehistoric LA, it really exists. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so this was the moment to maybe build something solid and non-grid-like. And so that's essentially why I asked him for a proposal, and we're 10 years later. Well, you're building. 10 years later, and you are now working towards, what, breaking ground, all being well in about a year and a half, two years for rough completion. I mean, I've seen dates of 2023, and well, no, it's, so it's, it, it's, a real, it's a real thing now. <laughs> Theoretically, yes. No, it's a real thing. The, uh, we, uh, the problem with these projects is that they're very big, they're very complicated, and you have to raise $650 million. Um, last week we announced, or two weeks ago, that we had gotten to the 450 mark, so it does seem really clear. 2023 has always been the date because that's when the metro stop opens. And in LA, um, the biggest requirement of any new building is that everybody wants more parking. So by having it timed with the opening of the subway, the metro, um, hopefully we will not have to have quite as much parking for the new building, which is the idea. So, so the building itself is, um, I mean, it's, it's a unique shape. Uh, it's one story stretching over Wilshire Boulevard in, in the uh, 
uh, the planned, um, the second draft of, of the building uh, as it is. It's, uh, Zumta himself has described it as wanting it to look a bit like a, a temple, possibly an Inca temple, now in this sandstone. It was a, a black building before picking up on, on the tar of the tar pit. But, but I guess as we're here and we've been talking about the collection, what I wanted to ask you about is, is how you envisage the collection inside that building. What, what is the kind of way of a visitor encountering a collection that has more than 135,000 objects in it? Not of which, no, not shown all at once, obviously. But uh, so what it looks like, I figured that's the architect's job, right? I'm going to push the architect to, to really deal with the philosophical issues. Um, the reason it goes over Wilshire Boulevard has a little bit to do with the philosophy and how the philosophy came into conflict with the real world. So for me, the, one of the most important things was that the main galleries be horizontal. And you know this, for, for me, every great, the greatest museums have had these horizontal spaces, the great Beaux-Arts buildings, the great galleries of the late 19th century, whether or the new buildings like the Menil Collection or um, and even when, it, when it's lifted, like the Alta Pinacothek in Munich is one long floor, but it's lifted, uh, this one floorness means you don't have to think about escalators and elevators. You kind of get to the floor, and then there's a beautiful horizontality. And there was a conference at the Guggenheim, somebody was telling me about that I didn't attend, of curators, architects, and artists who agreed on nothing about the design of museum buildings, but one thing, they all said horizontal museums are the best. Dia Beacon is a very horizontal museum. But in that horizontality, I did not want a Beaux-Arts building that has a directionality. So if you go to a Beaux-Arts building, there's a temple facade. You, have, you go up to pray to the art. Um, it's high above you. And then you have an, a symmetry and an organization. Some things are first, some things are last. In most museums, you would start with, like across the nearby, the Greco-Roman or Egyptian traditions to European art. But that's not the way LA works. LA is not about a hierarchy of cultures. And so I demanded that the building not have a facade or a front. Why don't you have a front? The architect put it best. He said, so you don't have a back. So no cultures in the back. Nobody's in the back of the museum because it doesn't have a front. So that politics of the horizontality and the non-hierarchical valuation was really important. And then the second uh, principle was transparency. You have you stonewall. Most of the, we went from 600,000 to 1.6 million visitors in the last eight years. A lot of them were first time museum visitors. If you don't have open plazas, window, places to easily walk for free, my view was that the entrance had to be designed by Renzo Piano so you could walk your dog through it. If you don't know what's behind the stone wall, why are you going to go? And so the idea of it being transparent, see in, that there are people there, there's art there, and then see out to Los Angeles. So when you see your old master paintings, you know that they're in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. was really important to me. So transparency, no front, no back, horizontality. It'll also be um, energy efficient because there'll be solar panels. But that was how the shape emerged out of principles, not out of any idea of design. I had no idea what it was going to look does, like. Does it mean sort of less wall space? I mean, if you've got more transparency, can you show fewer objects? Does that Matter well, most museums future? should show fewer objects. Um, you know, if you look at the techniques of installation that a lot of modern and contemporary museums have begun to develop, where they're more experimental, Dia Beacon is one, sometimes less objects, but more focus allows us to focus our attention better and not be barraged by so many things we don't know what we're looking at. So that's not a bad thing. It's a little less walls, but not dramatically less. Um, everybody says, well, how can you have a museum with glass on the outside? Do you have any idea how many works we have that are impervious to glass, uh, to light, like whether they're marble or uh, different kinds of stone? Um, and the way the building's designed is actually light. He's a master of light. So on the edges of the building, you have daylight with overhangs, so it's never direct. And then as that light falls off as you come inside, you'll actually be able to show photographs which are especially light sensitive, but then you'll be able to turn your head and look out a window at Los Angeles instead of being in an enclosed stuffy box. But to, to press this question of, of showing fewer objects, 
in a, in a museological context, it's something that Hardwick Fisher has been saying in the British Museum as well. And, and he's thinking after Neil McGregor's very successful tenure, but about the kind of reputation of the museum in the world, Hartwig Fisher is thinking about what the museum needs internally to rationalize its collections, but also to think about what the future of a so-called encyclopedic museum is. And, and for you, would, will you be happy? Do you want people to see LACMA as an encyclopedic museum in the new building, or is it something else that you're creating? Well, encyclopedic is one of the most charged and complicated words, because the idea <laughs> that, like, the up from the Enlightenment through the 19th century is that what is a museum is like a library, you have one of everything, like Noah's Ark, it's an encyclopedia, and you can refer to everything. We, of course, know that's a complete falsehood in so many ways. One, you can never have an encyclopedia. Two, our definition of completeness changes all the time. How recently was it that the Metropolitan included African art? Or, so our definition's constantly changing. And so we should, we use it because we don't have a good name, general museum, museum of everything. You know, there are two ways to say that. You can say you're going towards completion, a com completeness, which is the false notion of encyclopedia. Or I can say, you know what? How about everything goes, anything goes? film, we have forks and spoons in our collection, we have blankets, we have, which is normal, we're not the only one, so why not think of it as opening rather than as defining, and then, so how would you express that? One of the ways is to take these artificial constraints, um, even geography, you can say it's not an artificial constraint, it is an artificial constraint, because we, we even debate at the Whitney Museum, who's an American artist? Is it because you lived in America? You were born in America? You made work in America? Like, what's the definition? Cities have become cosmopolitan cities like this or nexuses for artists from all over. So even the problematic of geography, I think, is, is really worth exploring. So the idea is if you take those constraints away, and so this museum would be designed to, one of the things it's designed to do is to rotate. So instead of having absolutely fixed collections, um, one of the problems, if you have a Beaux-Arts building and you change the main gallery, nobody can walk through the museum for the time of its change. If you create sub-gallery structures within a general circulation pattern, you can change or rotate any part of this museum and no one will miss it. They'll have a beautiful view around it. This seems to be a, a, a new way of thinking as well about so-called permanent collections. I know that Julian Raby at the, the New Look Freer display, he's, he's banned the words permanent collection, even though there are works from the or permanent display. Yes. Because the permanent galleries are things that, that people are working on the whole time. They're studying the whole time. Well, by the way, we, we damned them by calling those permanent galleries and then calling these special exhibitions. So if you go to a museum, which are you going to go to? The permanent galleries, you can see, or the special exhibition. And so at our museums, we have 70% of the people going to the special exhibition, even though we have billions of dollars of our assets and curatorial intellectual firepower and connoisseurship in the permanent collection. So I, I think one of the strategies is to simply get rid of those distinctions and let's say you're just going to see art and you're seeing art in various configurations across time and space and thematic and geographic and let's, we shot ourselves in the foot with that whole push to blockbuster and special exhibitions, we essentially devalued our fixed assets. So, so it sounds like a, a museum that, that can constantly evolve in what it, it presents. And I, I just wanted to go back to the building because obviously uh, that's something that has evolved. I mean, quite. I think it's, it's no secret that, that you, there was a, an initial plan and, and a second version. And I wanted to ask you um, just about how much for you working on such a huge capital project, kind of pragmatism and or compromise are, are things that you feel are necessary parts of, of that, working in museums? Well, the idea is compromise is a way of maybe starting a discussion with, um, with a, a problem, an intractable problem. Hopefully the result is never compromise of the thought process. So a great case in point would be the original black flower design, which was intended to fully embrace the La Brea tar pits and almost mirror, and we even talked about science displays inside. And the scientists said, that's okay, but we actually need more land to dig because of all of LA has been built on. 
and you're taking up space that in 100 years, we dug over here for this problem, which is climate, first for ice age animals, then now we're digging for climate change. What are they gonna want in the future and have we destroyed this by digging? We need more space. So they uh, threw that at us as a problem and it actually almost became a conflict that killed the project because we were constrained in space until I recall that Peter Zumtor himself had proposed at one point using our parking lot across the street and building a bridge, which I told him would never happen, we'll never get permission, do not do that. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe if we're saving the tar pits, the Natural History Museum would like that idea that we were using the parking lot instead of that space. And they did. And we presented to the county and the city a museum that literally bridges across Wilshire Boulevard, which will be very visible in the center of the, of the metropolis. Uh, and so that's not a compromise. Actually, that resulted in a spectacularly unique uh, building that will be incredibly visible and open to people and have street life and do things that it wouldn't do otherwise. Well, well on that note, that's, that's a really interesting. You've talked already about how you want the old master paintings to feel like they're in LA. Well, they're not going to feel it, but for people who see them to, to feel that they're in LA. And you're talking now about people being able to see even a horizontal, of course you can see a building uh, uh, that goes up vertically, like Tate's a switch house, because it's a skyscraper. But you're talking about something that does make its mark on the LA landscape. So I suppose that's one answer, that's a symbolic answer to the question that, that I want to ask you. But how does this new building and the idea of this new look LACMA speak to what, what LA and the, the inhabitants of LA need culturally? Well, I think it's, I mean, if you summarize some of what I've said, I, I hope you would see that mirror. So also the idea is that Peter Zimter is known for his near sacred spaces. People always talk about his buildings as meditative. Now, you would not look at Los Angeles and say meditative about that environment. So the idea was, could you hire the architect who does the meditative and then work to have the casual outside and the meditative inside? So that's a movement from street life to meditation and back. Um, could you create a, a system of a museum that was horizontal, non-hierarchical, and slowly ever-changing? That's a lot like Los Angeles horizontal, non-hierarchical, and slowly ever-changing. Neighborhoods, cultures, changes, all of that. So if you think about it being a mirror of the metropolis in combining architectural features and programmatic features, I think that's the idea, is can you reflect or mirror the values of the society and including the fact that things will change, not try to nail it down to be fixed. Uh, LA neighborhoods are constantly changing. And so that all made sense that it was, a, I would say, a reflection. But also a, a, a map for the future, maybe, or? Well, I, I mean, I don't know a map for the future. I mean, the, the thing is, I don't know what, it, this is gonna require a, a higher level of curatorial practice because if you take the constraints off, which is an easy way to line things up, you require, and we're already having quite a few meetings among curators about de thinking deeply about thematics. How do you look from a non-Western perspective? Can you do that in a Western museum? How do you look across time and space? Uh, what themes are relevant to bridge uh, that work and of course certain themes might be relevant today and in 10 or 15 years a different theme what's really clear though is that the problem of objects fixed in space is that the, the good and the bad thing is they tell a story but if they're fixed in space they tell a story the truth of our world is that there are many stories told even about a single object and so you have to arrive at that object from different points of view in different ways. You can take an 18th century Mexican painting and you can say, well, should I show it with the art of the Americas because it was done in a period of colonization or post-colonization? Should I show it in relation to the European artists who often came to Mexico and then sent work back. They were trained and came, even though they're sort of uh, indigenous materials used. Or should I actually look at the similarities of the screens and bowl shapes that are relate to all the trade that was going on and the fact that a lot of those Mexican 18th century objects were made in the Philippines, they're made in relation to the screens that the, that the emperor of Japan sent to the vice royalty of Mexico. And you think, is what way do I show them? There's too many ways and the answer is, show them a different way, 
now and then a different way later and then let people see the same objects in different contexts. And I think it, it's actually just thrilling and great for marketing. <laughs> you know, it's better to have many <laughs> stories than one story because it's fun and changing as well as being intellectually challenging, hopefully. I mean, it's, but, but it's, it's not really a, a new way. It needn't be a new way of doing things either. It's a great tradition of saying in museums, things are not actually as fixed as... One problem is that there are, there are certain ways of looking back and, and maybe filtered through modernism where things have become megalithic or the idea that things were already fixed. You look at John Soane's museum in London and, and you read his description of that. He has a picture gallery in which the different uh, hinged panels open up so you can see different pictures in different lights and you can have different arrangements in a museum in 1820. And he writes saying, the great thing about my museum is that you can always see things from different perspectives at the same time. Right, and, it, and if you look at the first museums that were by force in, for example, with a lot of daylight, like the Dulwich Picture Gallery or other things, the changing light of the day constantly created different viewing environments, like the windows around this museum. So it's not as if, but I, I think that over the last hundred years or so in these big organizations, for the sake of clarity and categorization of knowledge, we overfixed things and maybe for the sake of quality and measure too. And I think we've done all that research and it is time to let loose a little bit. And, and, and in letting loose a lot of times, we're going back to other precedents. For example, it wasn't long ago that art museums were separated from natural history museums, right? Art, even in, in Los Angeles until 1965, the paintings were shown with the dinosaurs. I mean, in New York, they were separated a little earlier, but um, that's kind of a cool thing that now we're looking at the relationship between culture and nature in a new way, and so natural history, and so a lot of what we're doing is just going back and looking at um, maybe even times that were more holistic rather than more compartmentalized. Listen, I've got to ask you, you, you mentioned earlier uh, the Geffen gift and this uh, kind of fact that you've got up to $450 million, I, I think that's right, in a, what was a 600 or maybe in some places reported as $650 million you need to break ground on, on this new building. Um, I, I kind of wanted to ask you, uh, maybe in a if slightly... If there's anyone here who wants to <laughs> contribute, that's what you wanted to ask, right? <laughs> well, he, he'll have his hat out later, he'll come around. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask you, though, whether in putting that marker down and saying... 600 million is, is what this building is going to cost. I mean, that's a heck of a thing to, to create as a capital project for yourself as a, as a director and a fundraiser. And I, and I wanted to say, were you kind of, are you kind of, um, I don't know, is it a gambit to try and also change the way people in LA think about fundraising? Is, is there a different climate of fundraising over there? And you said that this is actually a way of transforming how people might think about giving. Um. Definitely is the answer to that question. So LA is just a younger city. It ha doesn't have as many generations of philanthropy and examples and projects and people like me working over many, many decades and years to cultivate that. And, and people said to me early on, well, can't you do a smaller project? Like, wouldn't it be easier if it cost less money? And I, that was where I was adamant to say no, <laughs> because LA has excelled. You know, there's been gifts of 25 or $50 million, for example, the road building or others, things an individual could do. And I know that's a crazy idea that an individual can spend $50 million, but on paintings even. Um, and I said, I wanted a project that was big enough that no one could do it alone. The idea being that you would fundamentally alter the philanthropic infrastructure the camaraderie and the collective in a city that has not been known for its collective thinking. It's a city that's known for wild and wonderful individual creativity, and it's not known for, hey, let's all get together and do something. Um, and so with if the project was big enough, it would either fail or create what I would call the infrastructure of philanthropic capacity. And when it succeeds, because it will, this metropolis, these people, will be able to take on more, not less. They won't be exhausted, but quite the opposite, hopefully. They'll be ready to spend $50 million on an old master painting to add to the collection, or whatever it is that we'll do that we find important, and we have more projects than we can fund right now 
which will take too long to talk about, but that's the essence of it, to, to sort of have something big enough that you have to work together um, and you have to change the way you work to, to accomplish it. Um, Michael, I realize I've, I've been asking you lots of questions and we've been going on for nearly an hour. You, could, could you take a couple of questions from the floor? Yeah. Is that... Uh People are yes, they ask bored. Nice questions. If you're bored already, <laughs> you can raise your hand and leave. I, if you, I, th I think it's... Uh, questions. Everyone's listening to us right now. Has anybody got a question questions? that they'd like to ask uh, Michael Govan? Anything? Uh, yes. There's a question. Uh, you just uh, concluded by saying that in Los Angeles, uh, you don't have uh, collaboration uh, or collective uh, um, achievement. As much. As much. Uh, but isn't uh, movie making the most uh, collaborative uh, form of art? Uh, yes, that's a good, it, well, it is, yes, it is, but it is, um, any business is also collaborative because you have to have all the working parts. It depends on whether you think of the director as an auteur or as a, as a director of a collaboration. I'm talking about civic purpose not business purpose, and there's a, there's a difference. I mean, if you just look at, right now we're struggling with homelessness, transportation, and you're seeing a new generation of people who are willing to tax themselves, uh, voluntary water reduction. I'm, these are things that are, are actually changing in LA, and I think there is a difference between a, a collective that's working towards a profit <laughs> or towards in that artistic collaborative way and something that has to cut across um, a much larger demographic and civic purpose. And listen, I'm an LA booster, so I believe in it. And when people said, well, is LA fundamentally less, is it more self-centered or less philanthropic than New York? And I would say, no, it's just younger. It, it just hasn't had the same number of generations to mentor that civic spirit. A lot of people moved from elsewhere. So. Yes and no. I mean, you, it's true that movie making is a collaborative art, and but so is a lot of big old master painting. If you're in Rubens' studio, that's a kind of like a movie, so it also has precedent, right? <laughs> I think there was another question at the front somewhere. Yes, this lady at the front. I think there's a microphone just coming. I was just wondering if you will be changing the curatorial systems because of your mixing all kinds of things. Yeah, well, so it, it, are there changes to the curatorial system? Well, yes and no. I mean, no, because you're looking for a variety of extraordinary expertise. You're looking for individuals that have extreme and intense knowledge and passion. And I don't think you have to look for generalists because often the best, uh, I think, of these kinds of projects might be done by a collaboration of specialists rather than a single generalist, but you do change the push to work across uh, expertise, across areas of specialization. I'm looking, and the curators know that we're looking for projects of collaboration. Um, and so I think there is a much stronger sense, we'll use the movie example, a much stronger sense that we need to produce projects, uh, some of them collaboratively. Now that isn't to say there isn't an individual genius with a fantastic show about two years in art history but even that would be a different thing because we don't present a gallery with two years of art history either. The, to remember this concept of change can be that it can be very broad and thematic, but it also might be more narrow than we're used to finding and that itself is different. So yes and no. No, we're still looking for that deep expertise, a diversity of it. Yes, there will probably be more requirements for collaboration and less departmental, if any, departmental segmentation. Um, Listen, can we, we're going to take one more question, then I'm going to wrap up with one final question. The gentleman... That Very intrigued by your idea of a permanent collection that is not oh, permanent, I <laughs> but that is, you know, ever-changing and is cross-cultural. How would that work in a museum that doesn't have collections from various cultures and times and places, but is more focused. Can you still create that environment, that energy? Um, well, one, I, I'm part of this thinking is to rethink this particular animal of the general, encyclopedic, whatever museum, and utilize this, the specific qualities and capabilities 
of collections that are so broad, but often segmented into what look like specialized museums, right? Like a collection of specialized, a condos of specialized museums. So one, I think what I'm trying to think about is this particular animal. Um, so for, but, and, and I'm not sure, by the way, DIA B, I don't, I don't, I'm not proposing that every museum do that. They're, I'm not proposing you change the Rothko Chapel. DIA Beacon is pretty fixed, often narrow and fixed, creates a beautiful des destination or something made in its time and place. So I, if everybody changes, it's chaos. I think you want the fixed and then you want some changing. I'm not even advocating that anybody else do what we're doing right now. You can watch us fail and decide or succeed and decide later. But, um, but one example would be the practice that you often see in what's more common in a contemporary art museum. So the funny thing is, you go to a contemporary art museum, a museum of contemporary art, Chicago, whatever, very little permanent collection anyway, constantly changing even though, and this is the question is, what's narrow? By encyclopedic museum st standards, that's one department, right? Because it's contemporary. But yet, the MCA in Chicago is showing art from all over the world. So it's it, you can sh you can see how reframing changes the definition quickly of what's narrow and what's not. We all know you could take a museum of just European art and slice it ten thousand different ways. So. Um, what I'm, I'm definitely not and absolutely not proposing is a one solution fits all. I'm actually proposing something that makes sense in the one, how do you turn the chaos of LA, the horizontality, the non-hierarchical quality, and the youngest encyclopedic museum, and make that an experiment that's advantageous rather than it just being a lesser version. And again, I do not want to propose this for the world. <laughs> Something that makes sense is probably that we wrap up in a, in a second. Um, I, I have one up for final short question for you, which is because uh, you said um, you needed to get to, by the end of 2017 to $450 million, uh, or, or it's been reported you've said this, to, to be really on target for, for getting to, to this, this target. Uh, and, and you've made it, and, and you've made it with two months to spare. And, and as a massively busy museum director, if you were able to take two months off now because you didn't have to do any more fundraising for the year, what, what would you do instead? Well, I hate when you, someone's done so much research as you have so you can hold me to <laughs> statements. I woke up the next morning after the last gift and realized I had just been given license to raise the last 200. Because <laughs> if I hit the deadline, then you're actually handed the problem and uh, there will be no more, there will be no vacations, there weren't vacations, there'll be no stopping, you're always behind in these things, and if I had time off, I would, uh, as I did for the eclipse with my wife, uh, take off in my small airplane and then just fly over the mountains and landscape. Well, pictures. no stopping except at the end of this talk. Um, Michael Govan, much for Michael Govan, say, yeah, well, we'll try. Uh, we're over, even the technology wants us to stop. Um, I wanted to say a thank you as well to uh, Vera Luta uh, for, for listening to us talking about her work, which I thought was a rather unfair. <laughs> thank you, Vera. And, and thank and you, Jenny King, who's the curator who worked on the project. So thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. Enjoy the fair. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Programs uh, this week, TAFAF week, uh, that are in this booklet. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donald, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming.